I got a lot of good buddies that ride very hard. But I got a lot of buddies that were very evil, that had no remorse. I don't care if it come to, to knives, clubs, guns, or whatever. They feared nothing. And I guess that's what it is. If you can set that fear through somebody, you got control. I was a devil on wheels. I mean, to me, uh, it was the power. I was a devil. I set forth to have a bike by the time I was in ninth grade. I knew a lot of people that really rode really hard and just wanted to be like them. And I rebelled against just about anything. I've seen a lot of drugs, seen a lot of guns, seen a lot of drinking, seen a lot of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people die. Um, gunshots, knife fights. Yeah, I, I, I've had a couple of really good buddies that were were beat down. They're never the same after that. I've done a lot of things, beat down a lot of people. I've stole a lot of things. I've hurt a lot of people. My mom happened to be pretty sick. I hopped on my bike, rode a long, long ways. My mom doesn't live too far from the Salvation Army, and I happened to be riding, seeing a good old friend of mine standing outside, and uh, she told me what she did for the Salvation Army. And I said, man, my mom, she has no milk. And she goes, oh, we got that over here. And I said, well, how much do you owe you? She goes, oh, no, the Salvation Army is about giving. If you truly need it, use it. So my story starts with a gallon of milk. I told myself, how can I volunteer? What can I do to, to help out? Because I totally want to do something different than what I'm used to. Every Thursday I was there, and I'd do all the dishes. From then, I never left. He had a really bad reputation. If I ever met anyone, I wondered if God could ever capture him. I wondered that about John. Everyone was kind of shocked he worked at the Salvation Army. That's when we began to see a different side to John. Being employed with the Salvation Army and see the changes of others was a big experience. When the Holy Spirit came to me, I was thinking, oh man, it was the best feeling I ever had in my whole life. I know in my heart that I have been saved because I've asked for forgiveness. You know when Christ is in your heart, when you totally walk away from what you've done and you start over. You know, you can be in ministry and almost become accustomed to preaching about God's grace. But when you see it come into someone's life and just overtake them, it reminds you why you get up here every day and, and do Bible studies and preach and teach. And, because there really is life-changing power mm -hmm. in the grace of God. And man, we've seen it in John. He just wants to be more involved and he helps train these kids and feeds them. You just can't imagine where these kids are growing up. Some of them have told us that they haven't eaten in a couple of days. And when they get here, they're absolutely starving. Same thing with our clients. He feeds them and tries to tell them about Christ. People do rely on us, and they do count on the Salvation Army. I love my job. I love the Salvation Army. I love what the Salvation Army is about. What John's really shown people is there's never a moment in your life when you're beyond the reach of God's grace. All those guys used to look up to him because he was so mean and tough, and now they look up to him because he cares about them. He really gives them hope that God's not done with them either. I would have been a Lucifer Jr. back then. And right now, I'm a child of God.
Good morning, John. It's Friday. A few weeks ago, a company called Visually emailed me and was like, Hey, Hank, if you could do a high-quality animated video on any issue in the world, what would you choose? Now, that was a hard choice. But I went with incarceration in America because it is messed up. Now, crime is also messed up. Bad things happen to good people, and that's terrible, and something should be done about it. Well, we send people to prison to be punished and to prevent them from doing bad things again and to deter others from breaking the law. Punishment, corrections, and deterrence. Now, we have this habit of thinking of prisoners as something very external to society. After all, there are literal walls between them and society. Walls capped with razor wire and watched over by people with guns. But millions of prisoners are released each year. Today's prisoners are tomorrow's neighbors. So corrections should probably be the most important piece of the incarceration pie. Unfortunately, it is not. We are, however, really good at punishment. America has about 4% of the world's people and about 25% of the world's incarcerated people. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Over the last 30 years, that number has skyrocketed, increasing over 400%. 41% of American juveniles and young adults have been arrested by the time they turn 23. Children as young as 13 years old have been sentenced to die in prison. And our prisons violate international standards. Solitary confinement increases instability and violence and in inmates and is considered by international law to be torture. But in America, it's not regulated by anyone except the prison officials. No judge, no jury. Arguably the most devastating form of punishment we enact in this country, and yet there is no appeals process. And you think it's hard to get a job in America? Well, we make it intentionally more difficult to get a job once you have a conviction on your record, not to mention just to live your life. Convicts are ineligible for welfare, student loans, public housing, food stamps, and are often so Socially disconnected from community and family support structures, so in addition to having high recidivism rates, they have very high rates of homelessness and suicide. Somewhere along the way, we started to think that being tough on crime meant being tough on criminals, but that's not the same thing. Punishment is only one piece of a much larger crime reduction pie. And it's an expensive one, with some institutions paying more than $100,000 per year per prisoner. Long prison sentences have helped to decrease crime, but no more than 25% of the decrease we've seen can be attributed to incarceration, and it costs far beyond just dollars. The cost is to people, to our country, to communities, to families, and to ourselves. The policy seems to be if you've committed a felony, we just give up on you. These wars on crime, wars on drugs, they are wars on people. The smart political move is to appear tough on crime because crime is scary, so we increased minimum sentences, we arrested more people, we sent more of them to prison. That's how we looked tough on crime, but the results are in. It's bad policy. It's cruel, it's short-sighted, and to continue this policy of mass incarceration would be foolish. We're living inside of a massive $75 billion per year failed experiment. 2010 was the first year in nearly 40 years that the number of incarcerated individuals in America did not increase. Policymakers are beginning to realize the magnitude of this failure, but there is a long way to go. John, I'll see you on Tuesday. I was one of the lucky ones because when, as I was growing up, every one of my, pretty much every one of my friends had either went to juvenile, was already in prison, um, or in and out of prison. Um, I was one of the few lucky ones that, that didn't until I got older. First, I started um, using drugs recreationally and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Everything that, that I did, everything that had to do was just with me getting high at, at any cost, even, even at, at my freedom. And before I knew it, I was picking up, you know, one, one felony after another.
What really affected me most, I have a, da I have a daughter, she's turning 18 next month. She was four at the time. And of course that affected uh, everything. It affected my, my daughter because for the next five years, I, I was an absent father. And when I, wa you know, when I was there, I, I wasn't the father that I know that I could have been. I remember exactly, it was in 2005, um, sitting in a jail cell, bored out of my mind, nothing to do, and the only thing that was in there was a Bible. Never touched or picked up a Bible before in my life. Picked it up, I started to read it. There was a couple, I, I don't even remember their name, but I could see their faces clearly, an, a very elderly couple, probably in their 80s, along with two of their friends would come every week and hold a Bible study for us. Bunch of convicts, bunch of inmates in there, bunch of people that are on drugs, violent crimes, you name it, we were all in there. And they would hug us all and tell us that they loved us. And I used to go back to my cell and I used to think like, what makes these people want to come here to a jail and show and, and tell us they love us and talk to us about God? I just didn't understand it. I knew they were getting paid for it. They were just wanting to do that. And when I, as I read the Bible more, I realized it was God in their heart. I remember being in my cell as I was reading my Bible and I said, I want what they have. In prison, I continued doing all that I could. I, I took all the programmings, the life skill classes that I could take. And when I got out, I knew I had to find a home church. I needed to find a purpose. And I believe another thing that God put in my life was the Salvation Army. I remember going the first, it was two years ago, going for the first time to services. And I really enjoyed the service. I enjoyed everything about it. So I went home because I was still shocked that the Salvation Army was a church. So I Googled them, looked up their webpage and it, I was amazed. All the things, the different types of ministry they're involved in. I realized they also have prison ministries. And um, at that point, I knew that prison ministry was something that I've always wanted to be involved in because those two people that touched me that day, um, I wanted to try to allow God to use me to do that one day. So my, my goal and my dream is to one day to be able to go back, um, back to prison, not as a, not as an inmate, but as someone that's going to go in and, um, and share the word of you know, Christ with, with other inmates. And I believe that if we find a purpose um, in serving God, you know, that, that's going to definitely, uh, that, that will be the, the things to keep us from ever going back again. Life was everything I wanted. Houses with ocean views, more licensed cars than licensed drivers. I was making a lot of money. It was just going great. We were putting in 10, 12, 17 hour days and, and these guys just were always energetic and we were able to go surfing and have fun and then work these massive hours. You know, I wanted to be able to have that energy and I thought, why is it that they cannot get tired and make more money? I found out that it was uh, crystal meth. Next thing you knew, I was hooked. The next seven years were a blur. I loved it. I was high the day I got married. I couldn't focus on anything being the one true love in my life except for the drugs and alcohol. My wife said she was going to divorce me. I lost my businesses. I lost my kids. And in about a three years time, I hit the streets. 
it be, just became a fearful, frantic attempt to just survive. So much energy went into it, and by then the day would be gone, the drugs were gone. One day I ran into another, and before I knew it, years had gone by, and I was just stuck on how do I survive today? I laid down on the beach just to rest for the afternoon, and I woke up two days later. Sunburn, you know, messed myself. There was a sense of anger and total madness. I was the guy going down the street having a blood-curling, screaming argument with myself. I went insane. So I went out to the beach that night. To the end of the jetty, my goal was I was just gonna jump off. I was gonna commit suicide. My God just said, it's gonna be all right. I just started crying. I said, Lord, I just want to quit getting high. And then it just hit me. The truth is I do want to get high and I hate that I want to. So help me change on the inside. Even my own family wouldn't take my calls. And the Salvation Army said, I'll take your call. And, no, and I had nowhere else to go. You know, there was a love and an acceptance there. And we had three other people. They completed the program. They had stories just like mine, but they didn't need to use and drink anymore. I decided then I wanted to know Jesus like that. He has become everything to me. My savior, my friend, true anchor, my gotta have it. Everything's because of it. And then I would do anything for him because he's done everything for me. With God on my side and good people around me, I was able to put a day behind a day and then years behind years, I would meet a woman that loves the Lord and we get married two days after we get commissioned as Salvation Army officers and later to have two more wonderful kids that now I get to raise in a way that is totally different. I set them on the right path and they'll never have to see that father and that life of the destruction. Sadly, my first kids have followed in my footsteps. I got the letter saying that my daughter landed in California State Penitentiary, and she says that she wants to know God like I know God was everything I've been fighting for from the beginning is that she would come to this point that when she was ready for help, that there would be a dad there to help her out. I just got on my knees and I thanked him. I said, thank you. Prove faithful once again. Become real to her like you become real to me. And I believe that he will. Uh, that just happened two weeks ago, so it's still overwhelming. I worked a hard time, a long time. I didn't know, and I thought, I thought I'd be getting, and I thought I'd be doing her funeral. And I probably, you know, still think I might be doing my son's. But I'd sure rather be doing their weddings. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs>